but I think what I have that I could tell that I could say is a mind trick <laughs> is something along the lines of you absolutely have every power to change anything about your life that you want but it's going to be hard and it's going to fucking suck hey welcome to episode 37 of the rosh Trevina project if you enjoyed this episode then give it a share on social media drop a review on apple podcasts like subscribe and catch me on instagram and twitter at rosh Trevina. today's guest is the host of the chicken mind nuggets podcast ladies and gentlemen i give you wifey D-R-E. What made you decide to start the podcast and where did the name Chicken Mind Nuggets come from? Yeah. <laughs> oh, are we starting the episode already? Yeah, yeah. You can start from oh, there okay. if you like. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I have a habit no, of that, you're... of just uh, <laughs> ambushing my guests. <laughs> no, it's all good. Uh, so I wanted to start this podcast because when I was doing um, Despair and Distress, I uh, was talking about topics that I... Uh, present in chicken mind nuggets, but I didn't really, I realized there wasn't really a listening audience. There wasn't anyone that was really interested. I mean, just despair and distress is more creepy topics. Um, you know, my sister uh, in law, our friend, and myself getting drunk talking about creepy topics, and there was no room for the scientific transformation realm of things that I really love to bring into it. <laughs> Excuse me. So um, I asked them, I said, Are you guys going to? are you guys okay if I start a side project? And they were more than happy. Um, when I would read things online that I found interesting, I would call them mind nuggets as a way to kind of keep them like a, a mental, you know, uh, like uh, keep this in, in my mental repertoire. And then I just thought it was funny to put chicken in front of it, like chicken <laughs> nuggets, but chicken mind nuggets. And so <laughs> and that started. And I already had, uh, you know, some people who knew who I was from despair and distress. So uh, it, it was kind of easy to make that transition with this side project. And, you know, despair and distress is coming to an end in the next couple of weeks. And so Chicken My Nuggets will be my only podcast platform. Oh, that's awesome. I don't think I've actually listened to your other podcast yet. Oh, OK. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Um, we've been doing it for a couple of years, but... All three of us have different schedules. I work 12 hour night shifts. Um, Danielle has a varying schedule depending on when um, she's able to meet with people and clients. Katie has a different schedule and it makes it very difficult for us to get together at all. And so we realized it's probably about time for it to just come to an end. What are the pros and cons of doing a podcast with other people versus doing a podcast by yourself? It's definitely a big difference. Um, but doing it with other people, it has to be, you know, decisions have to be made with a um, a lot of care that everyone's considerations are taken into account. You know, whether we want to, you know, for example, we had a bunch of people approach us about advertising and we said no to a lot of it because it didn't fit. We, we didn't want to have to advertise something for meal prep or whatever if we uh, weren't doing anything like that. I mean, we had creepy food episodes but you know i'm not going to say oh yeah you should try this great meal delivery service if you don't <laughs> ag agree with it but then during that episode we're talking about maggot cheese like it doesn't uh. work so yeah um and so we've all talked about you know a lot of decisions that we've made together um and, and that's the big thing is that you have to really look at everyone's interests and the direction that they want to take things and for my show, um, it, it's all me. I, you know, I decide, hey, I can upload this week. I can't upload this week. I have the time to record, or this is the topic I want to uh, present. These are advertisers, and by the way, I don't have any. It's uh, I don't want any. Um, so I, it, it's definitely a world of difference, and um, they both have a lot of good and bad. But uh, for my show, I, I'm very, very independent, and so I like being able to take charge and make the decisions on my own. I, I think I'm more, a little more comfortable with kind of doing everything on my own. I'm also 
if, if it goes south, it's a hundred percent my fault and that's okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, I, there's no guilt about crap. We all made this decision together, but we're all taking the flame for it. And so, I, yeah. What's the process of you deciding what to talk about in each episode? There's a couple of different things um, that come into play when I talk about things. Um, for season one, when I did this last year, I already had a lot of ideas. They were kind of things I wrote down wet when I did despair and distress that I couldn't talk about, um, you know, subjects that weren't, again, appropriate for that audience. And so I was able to get a lot of ideas for that. Um, I was also doing my uh, bachelor's degree and there was a lot of topics that came up with uh, doing the bachelor's degree that I thought would be really, really interesting for my audience to hear. And so those things came together really well for season one. Now for season two, it's a little bit of digging further into my history and going into topics that I wasn't sure if I was comfortable bringing up yet. Um, I haven't done very many sciencey episodes so far in season two, but I have a couple different sources that I'm going to start pulling from. Um, but it, a lot of it too kind of depends on, hey, I remembered this situation happening and I remembered this lesson that I learned from it. And I, I would like to share that. And then if I'm able to get the script correct to put into words how I want to portray it and I record it and it sounds good, then I'll present, then I'll present it. Um, there's already been a couple of episodes that I've had to scratch. I went, this, this isn't going to work. Um, it's not how I want to say it. And I still have episode lists that I want to make, but I have no way of putting those down into, onto paper yet. I don't, I don't know how to say it. So it's kind of a combination of, of different things, how I come up with them. Your episodes are nice and short. Um, was that a, a conscious decision or is that just how long they end up being after you've written down everything or say everything you want to say? It was definitely a conscious decision. Uh, and that came as a result of doing um, or two, two things, uh, doing despair and distress or episodes are at least one hour. They're one hour, sometimes an hour and a half. I don't think we have any two hour episodes and although they're a lot of fun, I know that um, there's a lot that goes into the editing. I don't do the editing, but I know that there's a lot that goes into the editing. And I work full time. Um, I'm now getting my master's degree. And I went, I don't have the bandwidth at all to do uh, our recordings. Plus, I don't like to hear myself for that long. Yeah. So <laughs> I went, I, I just want to do something short and sweet. And I, I realized too that there's a lot of podcasts that do episodes that are an hour or two hours and they're full of amazing content. Um, but not a lot of people have time to sit down and listen to those constantly. So I was looking into micro podcasts like um, Timber Hot Guys Buddhist Bootcamp and Mike Rose, uh, what was it? The Way I Heard Things or, 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 or then, and that's the way I heard it. Uh, and they're all very short and sweet. And those stuck in my mind better than episodes that were longer and I think it's because I sat down and went I do have these five minutes I do have these 10 minutes to listen so uh when I was writing scripts I realized when I recorded it that they were that long they were the same as a micro podcast and I went well I think it's going to be the way that it will work for my show I think they're the perfect length they're so digestible and I've like binge like loads of them I've I've it's a, I haven't quite listened to all of them but it's the closest to listening to someone's entire catalogue that I've come with yours compared to doing other uh, uh, interviewing other people. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, I made season one into, uh, well, I made an episode called the season one binge compilation and you can listen to every episode of season one in that one episode. And I think it is about a total of one hour or an hour and a half. So if, uh, you know, you want to just do it all at once, there's that episode. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Well, and in your show, you talk about having a turbulent childhood. Uh, how much of that are you able to share? Uh, I could sh I could share some. Again, I'm going to leave specifics out for uh, you know some safety reasons and just uh, out of respect for some people who are involved. Of course. Um, but I I had a really crazy childhood, and I didn't realize it until years of therapy. So 
Um, my mother was, <clears throat> excuse me, extremely narcissistic. And she had a lot of other issues as well. I don't think she was ever really diagnosed with anything, but I'm, I'm pretty sure she should have been. Um, I was the mother to her growing up. So if I did anything that upset her, then I had to baby her. And I remember doing that as young as six or seven years old. Um, she was very judgmental. She was very, uh, what's the right word I'm looking for right now? Um, inconsiderate and very rude. She would pull pranks that were extraordinarily inappropriate on my friends. And I lost a lot of friends because of it. People didn't want to be around and they didn't want to be around me or my mom. And I get, and I get it now. I didn't get it then, you know, when you're a young kid and you're just trying to make friends um, and you don't have any, you don't really realize that it's because of the way that you're reacting is a response to your mom and the way that your mom's reacting when you bring friends over. Um, you know, here's a good example. I, I did not like matching my socks when I grew up. Um, it was just something that I didn't want to do. And so she was dropping me off at, it was in preschool, but I don't remember what specific grade. And no, it wasn't preschool. I'm, I'm sorry. It was elementary school. And she noticed my socks on the way to school and she blew up at me. I, you know, how dare you wear two different socks? Everyone's going to think that we're poor. And just because we have no money and we are, I can't believe that you're going to represent me like that. And I went, God, okay. <laughs> and uh, being poor. <laughs> then, it, yeah, she was, I mean, this is, this is me in elementary school with this mother. And, yeah. um, you know, then she blew up and said, I, I can't let you make these decisions anymore. I will make every decision for you. And I, I, something hit me at that point, being a smart ass little elementary school kid. And it's one of my proudest moments, but um, I just listened to her. I didn't say anything. And then I got out of the car. And this was again after she said, I'll make every decision for you, bubble. So I got out of the car and she goes, aren't you going to say you love me? And I said, aren't you going to decide that for me? And I slammed the door. Ooh, <laughs> and I, and I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was so grounded. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, my dad wasn't much help. Um, he lost his job due to 9-11. At the same time, um, I was diagnosed with a serious medical condition and was in and out of the hospital. My boyfriend at the time um, forced me to do sexual acts as a revenge for dating his friend that he gave us permission for. We, I'm like, hey, you and I broke up, but your friend and I are interested in each other. Can we date? He's like, oh, yeah, that's fine. And it wasn't fine. So, I mean, this was, and again, this is scratching the surface. Things happened. And hmm. I, I really didn't understand any of it. And... When I was young, I would hold knives up to myself and say, it's going to end. I cannot do this anymore. And then I had a younger sister who blamed everything on me. And I, I, I didn't know how to handle this. And I remember calling my therapist, um, I'm sorry, my sister's therapist. And I said, I know you do not see friends and family of clients, but if I don't see you, I won't be on this earth within the next two weeks. And she totally transformed things for me. She took me in, um, really started to help me in ways that I, I can't even imagine. And then she, she made a comment about, hey, you've been dancing the same dance that your parents have. And sometimes you don't realize you're in the same ballroom if you're blindfolded and dancing. You just think that you're doing your own movements. And then that's when it just kind of blew me away. And I realized everything's been wrong. Everything, everything's been horrible. And it still took me years of making bad decisions after that to put my life together because I was unraveling over 21 years of consistent backlash and trauma. Um, so I'm 35 now. And I would say that my life didn't start getting put together until a couple years ago. So I like to share these stories with people because everyone has something. Everyone's, you know, I hate to say everyone's broken, but I don't think anyone's ever fully put together either. Mm. And I like to be able to relate with people and let them know that it, not that, oh my God, I went through something horrible, worse than you, Bob, but that's, that's not what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to say that I've like Brene Brown says, I have swamps, uh, swamp slushed. I've gone through these things. And if you're someone who's going through anything like that, 
here's what I was able to attain at the end. And so hopefully this is something that can help. Yeah, I, I agree with you, like, in regards to... I'm 32, and I don't think I sort of started to grow up until I was, like... <laughs> like close to 30 at least like in regards to putting my life together um and i i didn't even have like a particularly traumatic childhood either but yeah so um what like mind tricks did you do you have now that you wish you knew in your youth mind tricks like mind uh, tricks, things like, that i tell uh, me that's not even like a good word for it. like um sort of techniques to to deal with like anxiety or whatever it is Man, I still don't have any techniques. I have I have terrible anxiety. Um, uh -huh. It's one of the things that holds me back. And I was diagnosed with general anxiety disorder when I was in middle school. Um, and that was another thing is that um, there was a really bad car accident that I was in when I was you know, four or five-ish. And after that, I had terrible panic attacks mm. um, nightly. And so my parents put me on adult a prescription medicine that relaxes muscles and I was on that every night from about 4 to 12 they didn't know how to deal with me so I've lost a significant portion of um, critical development within my nervous system and my being on how to handle these things so very small things rattle me you oh, really? may not even yeah you may not even notice it if you look at me but like, you look perfectly fine but inside my nervous system cannot come down uh, calm down I cannot get the mind or the stomach to stop because all I knew growing up was being fed painkillers. Um, and so to this day, I have a very hard time dealing with certain things, things that don't bother people will shake me up on the inside. And again, I do a good job of not showing it. People will usually never know. My husband can tell. He's like, oh boy. Um, but I, I don't have anything that I could tell my younger self as far as anxiety. Um, but I think what I have that I could tell that I could say is a mind trick <laughs> is something along the lines of you absolutely have every power to change anything about your life that you want, but it's going to be hard and it's going to fucking suck. And you may not have any friends or family or any support in the meantime, and every single step you take forward, you'll take 10 back, but it's better than zero. It's better than nothing. And if tomorrow you can look back and say, I got an inch farther than where I was today, then be proud that you started that 10, 20, 30 year journey. Because at the end of all of that, you don't, you still don't want to be at zero. And it's not so much looking at it like oh this is a short life and we need to all be happy in this life and life is a playground and, and it, no no if it, it's about not not participating in anything bad i think it's the best way i can say it you know when i'm mean? looking at every thing that you can improve and improving it because if you're good and if you do things that are good and if you improve then the world does it, not so much in a narcissistic sense of you are that powerful to the world, but you're that important to the world. Everyone is because you are a part of it. And so if everyone had that mindset, it would be incredible. We could all do better. And all it takes is the person over here and over here and over here and over here doing things to make themselves better for things to collectively start moving forward an inch. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised that you do. I obviously thought maybe there was still a bit of anxiety, but you seem always seem so calm on the podcast, but that's an edited version of yourself, isn't it? Um, yeah. what, yes. what sort of things make you anxious, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, gosh. A lot of things. Um, security is one of my biggest ones. Um, I I get very scared about security. Uh, what is uh, that like? financial or like protection or kind of a little bit of everything um i would say that it's my biggest one because uh i i definitely double check doors it's part of the ocd as well um, oh, i yeah. double check I, doors I <laughs> yeah you know i want to make sure that at night when my husband and i go to bed um that there's you know the the doors are locked um financial security is a big one uh i have worked extremely hard 
at making sure I have I, I have supported myself in a way that I can be comfortable with because I have had no jobs. I've been homeless. I've had horrible jobs. And, you know, I, I, have, a, I have a good job now. And so I'm very protective of um, the benefits that come with that. Um, security, too, as far as my, my cats, my, my husband, the people that I'm closest with, it's, it's very much like a, a overprotective mom type of feeling in the sense of I, I want to make sure that these aspects of my life never have any issues. And they're going to, um, and that's okay, and I understand that, but those things rattle me to the core. And not a lot of things that would rattle, rattle other people don't not so not so much me and it, like for instance there's a lot of stories on the news about how bad this is how bad that is and you know yes yeah, some of those things do rattle me as well but i don't feel them hit as hard as something that would threaten my security and i think that's because i didn't have it for so long so it's still very close to me uh that's interesting i always see on like true crime shows that are like based in sort of like the middle of nowhere in america it's always like uh this what do they say like it's a town where nobody locks their doors or something it's like i i grew up in probably this one of the safest places on earth and we still lock our doors at night. like <laughs> is that is that a common thing for people not to lock their doors in certain parts of america or is that just what yeah. they say on tv no 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 very very common <laughs> that's, um that's crazy <laughs> it, it's it's stupid fucking nuts yeah so where, where i am i'm in a phenomenal neighborhood i'm in a great neighborhood my neighbors are great we love our neighbors we love our neighborhood um but we lock our doors we lock our cars lock our doors lock our gates and uh there's certain parts of rural america more in the south and the midwest uh, where they're very very small communities not a lot of outside influence comes in and they're the ones that will more or less have oh yeah we've known our neighbors we've been here for 50 60 years and they'll leave their doors open and people will you know just kind of walk in and say hey how you doing today and and that's okay but it's not very common anymore and it is only in certain parts of america but not where i'm in in arizona everyone locks their doors mm. yeah <laughs> uh no i just found that i just find that really surprising because you like you never can control who just would walk into your town even if it is a safe oh yeah place. yeah mm. yeah that's crazy um oh yeah you mentioned on your show that you draw influence from the philosophies of Taoism, buddhism stoicism and humanist was it humanistic humanistic judaism, judaism. <laughs> <laughs> uh what what is it that you take from all of those and also how does humanistic judaism differ from regular judaism so for for buddhism it's something i've been attracted to and uh, practicing for a couple years uh, i recently had a conversation with timber hawkeye from buddhist boot camp and he really helped to clarify a couple things for me in relation you know to um to some buddhist thought and it was incredible but the idea that life was that life is suffering was a difficult concept for someone who isn't like me who was suffering to understand because it almost felt like someone saying to me you're normal hmm. and i i hated it and i went <laughs> this is bullshit and then the more i looked into it it was like it, it's it's stating something and then saying that you don't have to be that way so it's saying there's a lot of hurt in life there's a lot of things in life life is suffering whether it's your mental voice your inside voice telling you from the moment you wake up from the moment you, till the moment you go to bed that you're a piece of shit or the things that you see on the news that life has suffering but you don't have to partake in it and it's not through enlightenment and meditation i mean it is if you want to go that route but it's also through not doing the things that cause suffering and so when i realized that that is that concept i went okay i can get on board with that and i started to look at healthy self mindful practices that they use um such as meditation not for enlightenment but for clearing out my head and it has helped me greatly and taoism has always resonated with me because i never grew up with God. Um, so my parents had two different religions growing up. 
And I didn't even know what uh, God was until I was 13. And I asked my parents, I said, what is this God thing everyone's talking about? And they said, basically, it's some figure in the sky that created everybody and everything. And if you don't like what they do, then you go to hell. And I'm like, but that's Santa. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I was 13 when you never had God. You, you don't know what it, you just, you had a lot of questions. And I went, this makes no sense to me <laughs> at, at all. Um, and so my parents decided to raise my sister and I without religion because they grew up with two separate religions and they didn't like it. So I started to look at Taoism. I, I meddled with it in high school, wasn't really into it, and then looked at it later and went, this really, really resonates with me because it was explaining more of, rather than a universal God or figure saying, this is everything I have created. This is saying, this is a universal energy that flows amongst everything kind of like a like a, a chi or just a universal spirit. And that felt more right to me, that everyone in some way and everything in some way is connected. And rather than calling it God, it's called Tao. So that's something I brought on board. Um, Stoicism and the humanistic Judaism are two relatively new things that I've decided to adopt. Um, the Stoicism part has helped me the most in my... Uh, emotions and how I reflect upon my emotions because I used to be someone who would show all the emotions and get emotional about things. You knew the moment I was upset. You knew the moment I was happy. And I didn't think that it was anything that I could control. But the more that I looked at it, the more I went, I can control it. And it started to be, it started as an experiment because I said, you know, I can't, I can't control. I'm, I'm going to, ha ha, let me try. Ha ha, I'll prove him wrong. Stupid stoicism. And I, I, I can control it. So I went, I, I created more of an experiment. I went, what is going to happen if I feel anger, but don't show anger in a situation? What happens within that situation? And every time it dispersed quicker, mm. every time I felt less emotional aftermath every time the other person was the one with all those emotions taking the emotional aftermath getting passionate and then it was an epiphany one day i went anger is useless it is absolutely useless i would watch people get angry i would watch people fight over things and they go i, I understand that you have a passionate viewpoint I understand what you are looking at through your lenses, but the anger itself is useless. And so then I started experimenting with it more. I went, what else is useless? Is having an outburst of happiness useless when I could easily feel that happiness on the inside and not have to be so outwardly um, displaying with it? it? Is sadness useless? Because what have I actually lost in anything? when we're all here on not only borrowed time, but borrowed bodies. So it became an experiment. The only thing I haven't conquered is the anxiety. Again, I, I, I try and it's diminished quite a bit mm. over the years. It really has gotten better in many ways, but I'm not where I wanna be. Um, and then the humanistic Judaism, um, my dad's side was very Jewish and um, it wasn't anything again that I had practiced but we had a lot of influence growing up um certain holidays we would have challah bread and you know we play dreidel we do those things and it wasn't till uh, a couple years ago i don't even know what i was looking up i don't remember it but it was something on wikipedia and it said the different branches and fractions of judaism and i went oh i know about that one i know about orthodox i know about that i know about hasidic now what's this humanistic one and I was curious because if it's something I don't know, I like to click on the link and at least learn. Hmm. So I clicked on it and I went, oh my God, I, I feel like this is something that I still feel, which is um, Judaism without the God. So I know that that sounds really like, huh? How does that, huh? How does that? But so it, it's looking at Judaism through a, a human and cultural perspective, saying that Judaism is something that has been created through years of 
different cultural influences and practices by human beings. Human beings are the ones that moved out of the desert. Human beings are the ones that have preserved memories. They are the ones that have brought in new ceremonies. They are the ones that practice the holidays. It's it's the humans. It's a combination of years and years of traditions and different beliefs, different languages by humans. And I went, yes, yes. Um, for me, that is correct for me. Um, I have started to strongly look into it and it's something that I resonate with on different levels. Some of it I don't, some of it I do. Um, I'm teaching myself Yiddish. It's something I knew a little bit of when I was younger. So I'm just kind of bringing it back. And so the combination of all of that, and it, that's the main, um, the main reason how it differs from other forms of Judaism is that um, ex especially Orthodox Judaism has very strong God influence saying that, you know, these documents are the documents brought forth by God. It's what you must follow. But there's not a lot of wiggle room in a lot of those things. There's over 600 rules that, you know, some areas need to follow. And it's like, well, you're, you're going to sin. You're, how, can you, how can you follow all these things? And humanistic Judaism is looking at it like these are rules imposed on us by us. We create what we have brought forth over the years. And it's, it's, I think it's just a really beautiful way of kind of celebrating thousands of years of human tradition that has been preserved through a lot of um, not only controversy, but obviously tribulations. So I, I hope that answered the question properly. So, yeah, it's essentially um, Judaism as a culture rather than a religion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's super interesting. Is there any parts of like the actual tradition that it ignores as well, or is it just the God aspect? Um, there's certain there's certain traditions. Um, some people within humanistic Judaism don't follow certain holidays um, because they are it, it either doesn't resonate with them or it's a little too much God influence. But the main thing is it's Judaism through culture with culture without the God. Ah, that's really interesting. <laughs> um, uh, what does working in a place surrounded by red buttons teach you about impulse control? <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> so you listen to that one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it, it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, it's been a phenomenal lesson. Something I very much appreciate. Have you ever been in, I, I don't know if they have these in the UK. Have you ever um, been in one of those escape rooms or heard of an escape room? Uh, I have heard of one. I haven't been in one yet, but I really want to go. Okay. So mm. I've been to a few of them here just as a, um, you know, with my husband and a few other people. And um, there, there was one that we went in and they need to have a specific uh, minimum number of people in order to go in, the, go in the room. It's kind of like a, you, you fill you fill a billet and then you go in the room. And, and so I think we're missing about three people. Mm. And they said, well, we have a group of three coming in and you can all do the same escape room together. We just need to wait. I said, great, no problem. And uh, so they came in and they gave us the rules. They said, do not press this red button <laughs> unless there is an emergency. And they're, okay. So they shut the door. They started the game. They started the clock at one hour, which is how long you and your group have to figure out how to get out of the room. One of the guys there who was drunk, not part of our group, part of the other three, said, I have to go to the bathroom and immediately hit that red button. <laughs> and we went, are you fucking kidding? And so they came in and said, what, what happened? And he goes, I have to go to the bathroom. And the girl went, this is why everyone went beforehand. And then he did it two other times. Oh, my God. Now, I don't work in an escape room, but <laughs> I, it, it was a huge lesson to me to watch this guy and really be fascinated with this guy going, how lack, but it, not even a lack, zero control of impulses, zero self-control, right? He made, a, he made the experience really difficult. He, he really, and they even offered us a refund. They said, we're sorry. <laughs> Not to mention, they can watch you the whole time that you're in the escape room. So they watched as we tried to figure out how to get out. And this guy kept pressing the red button. Basically, he's saying, like, I'm going to get out. Like, oh, my God. So I work in a place with a bunch of red buttons. And these buttons will, um, will shut down critical equipment. 
And hmm. they're obvious to everyone. It's, I mean, it's right there in front of your face. And when you have really hard days at work, when you're going through something and you just want out, it's very tempting to go ahead and to either press your mental red button and say, fuck it, I'm qu- I quit, or to press that red button. But nothing good comes of it at all. Hmm. And that's one of the things I've learned is that nothing good comes from it. I'm simply acting out of an emotion that is based on frustration of things that I haven't handled in a good way. So if I'm frustrated at work with people and I just want to get out of work that day and all I want to do is press that button, that button has nothing to do with the people who made me mad, which really comes back to how I'm handling my emotions and why I let in what they said. It has it, So the button becomes a completely severed part of that entire scenario. So when I wrote that episode, it was about how these buttons are there. They're optimal occasionally. They're still very tempting to press. Um, and I've seen people get very close, oh, very close. And uh, I, I've pressed yellow buttons before um, out of safety and it was justified, but uh, I, I have to realize that, that the red buttons are really five steps after the initial trigger and it has nothing to do with anything. It's like, what is it? The six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Kevin Bacon really has nothing to do with you. But if you can find those six connections, like you can find a pattern in anything, you'll eventually blame Kevin Bacon. Like I'll eventually go back to the red <laughs> button, but it has oh, nothing to do with the red button. So it's taught me about impulse control that to deal with it at the level it's at. Mm. It's not red button. It's not the four things leading to red button. It's what I have to deal with, what I have to deal with. I don't, I don't know if you have this in America, but on planes in Britain that when you go to wait for the toilet, there's like, I don't know if it's an emergency exit on the side of a plane or something. There's a there's like a red bar that says, do not touch. And it looks like it can come down. I don't know if it would open the door or not when the plane's flying. But oh, <laughs> it looks like yeah, that I know what you're talking the about. And oh my God, every time I'm just like, oh, don't do it. Don't. <laughs> you're you're tempted, just... right? You want to. It's, it's yeah. a shiny object in front of your face. You want to go for it. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> just ignore the, the escape door. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've, yeah fortunately i'm able to control my impulses no matter how strong they are good <laughs> uh, um what insights do you have about yourself by spending long periods of time in silence uh how busy i am how busy i am internally um how much is going on with not just the mental thoughts bouncing back and forth or the reminders of what to do or the anxiety that creeps up, or the busyness of different body functions, just how busy my body is, how busy my mind is. And then I realized that I'm adding junk out into space when I talk. Um, Jordan Peterson has a a phenomenal thing that he said, um, combining a couple of things that he said right now, he said, Uh, you should ask yourself every day, what incredibly stupid things are you doing to ruin your life every day? (laughs) And I thought that was brilliant because if you ask yourself that, you will get a hard answer (laughs) and you will realize you do a lot of stupid shit to ruin your life every day. And then it hits you so emotionally hard that it's hard to start from square one on how to fix it. He also said that he did a, a, a type of project where he was hyper-conscious of what he was saying and realized that um, 90% of the things that he said is dead weight and only 10% is actually valuable. And so he started shifting the way he talked and I went, that's absolutely brilliant. Mm. I'm going to start doing that. And so I continue to do that. And what I'll do is after I've had a conversation with a friend at work or Um, I reflect upon my day in the evening. I'll reflect in the morning. I go, what was dead weight there? What was, what's not valuable? What incredibly stupid things am I doing, you know, to ruin my life? And what I've learned through silence is I feel like I'm improving by 50% when I don't speak. And it's not because I feel like 50% of my talk is bullshit. I feel like it's because if I turn off my mouth, then I'm completely hyper tuned with my other senses, 
kind of like, you know, when you lose one sense, um, the other ones heighten. Mm. Like, have you, have you heard that before? Like if you lose, um, uh, what is it? Like some people have heard, said if they, when they lose their eyesight, like they can hear better. And I, I mean, I haven't ever been in that realm. I don't fully know if it's true, but yeah. Uh, I don't know Go if ahead. it's true or a metaphor, but yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, and so definitely if, learn to train to use it better for sure. Right. Yeah. And I, exactly. And I feel like that's what I do within my silence. Mm. Um, whether it's when I meditate, spend time alone or go through short periods of not talking, I am hyper tuning everything else and they automatically come online. Now they just, I, I, I feel like I'm listening better. I'm watching better. Um, I'm smelling better. I'm appreciating better. And I love it because I I can get different viewpoints of different people in conversations and not judgmental ones. Just, I never looked at your opinions that way before, or I never tuned into this sense before. And then I, and then I realized that there for me is a direct correlation between my outward talking and my inner talking, because if I say something out loud, immediately the inner voice will have a response or a reflection or a criticism. And so when I turn off the outward conversation, the inner one doesn't have anything to say back other than what other people have to say. And then that's when I can look at that one and go, you're being really judgmental right now, or you're, you're not taking other things that you know into consideration, or that was a really wonderful thing that you just said about that person. And so it helps me to fine tune my inner voice, which is the one that is on probably 110% of the time. And I think that that's the one that we need to be friends with more. Oh, that's super nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in your opinion, does everything happen for a reason? I used to say yes. Um, and I know I've done episodes about it and I still want to say yes. The reason being is because I, I still see it even with all the bad things and it doesn't justify the bad things whatsoever. And I'm not trying to do that. I think it, when I look back at all the really bad things in my life, I would say the reasons for them now are to not be like that and to learn how to not to be. So I can be someone in the world that doesn't ever have that effect on other people. Because when you do something bad to one person, they can do it to another person and then they can do it to another person. You never know what type of effect that you have on people. So I would like to think that because of that, if I do the best that I can, then that could transfer to other people and in a way that's a way of making the world better again. So I like to believe it, but I had a friend say something to me that blew my mind and I don't know, I, I just don't know how to explain it to myself yet. So I, I can't fully be on board with the statement. I, he was a fellow podcaster. We're really good friends. He also lives in the UK. Uh. And um, <laughs> so we don't, we don't talk very often, obviously the time difference and everything, but um, really good friend. And we were talking about those things. And I said, I, I do believe everything happens for a reason. And he looked right at me and he goes, you cannot tell me that a parent who loses their child, that that has happened for a reason. And I went, shit, I can't. And I never would. <laughs> but he's so right. Um, he's got two kids. I have no kids. Um, it's nothing I would ever say to a person. But what he was trying to tell me is that I haven't looked at every aspect of that philosophy and he was 100% right. So some people would say, yes, you know, your, your child died for this reason or for that reason. You see these stories on the news or in, you know, these different things of like uh, that, that would justify it to some people, mm. but that could never justify it to the parents. And so I've had a really hard time, saying that I fully believe that now because his comment has led to me thinking about other things. And I, I, I love that he said that to me. I love it because it's really, really made me think. Um, so I, I don't know if I can actually fully answer that question for you. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. That, 
that's a interesting one about the sort of the negative side of that as well. And also, I always, whenever it's said to me, I, I always just feel like it's too deterministic or am I thinking about it wrong as a statement? That's really interesting. Um, no, I, I, I understand where you're coming from, like having it be deterministic in the sense of A plus B happened because of C, no matter what, 100% of the time. It is set, it is determined, I get it. And that's not the right way of looking at everything happens for a reason. Hmm. I, I think that there's a broader picture with that. And I, I understand what you're, I understand what you're saying, but I don't, I don't think I have a good answer for that yet either. <laughs> um, it, it's something that I'm, I'm really, um, I did, I thought that it was something that was a hundred percent for me set in stone. Everything happens for a reason. And then he threw me off my boat into the water and said, think again, swim again. And I went, Oh fuck. <laughs> and now that's what that's what I'm doing. I'm like, I've got to rethink this whole thing. So, yeah, I, I just don't have any good answers for that topic at all. That's interesting. Um, you were in the military. Uh, you did an episode of being on being in boot camp, was it? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Was in what, the Navy. what did you learn from that experience? Oh, yeah, um, I was in the Navy. Um, I I look back on it now and I'm very grateful that it was an experience I chose to go into. I went into it for several different reasons. It, I felt like I had no other choice. Um, at the time, the person that I was with wasn't making, uh, comp him and I combined, we were in financial trouble. And it was in 2008 when uh, the big recession happened. Mm -hmm. And the only way for us to kind of guarantee some things was for me to join the military. I was the only one who was able. Um, so it wasn't anything I thought I would ever do. Um, I had a lot of threatening phone calls from that decision. My mom found me. She called me. She said, you're going to die. I'm like, oh, my God, here you go. <laughs> and other people called me and they said, I can't believe that you're joining the military industrial complex. I'm like, whoa, whoa, let's step back. Let me tell I'm you down. why I'm doing this. <laughs> yeah, let me let's step back. And it was it was hard. Um, it's not easy. Boot camp was being it. It was being thrust into a situation that I never had any experience with any, I just well, obviously no, no experience with, but I couldn't even imagine what it was like. And I went through and went, this is even worse than I thought. And then I get to the ship, which had an extraordinary amount of challenges and people I, I've never, besides high school, I've never been in an environment where there are so many like-minded people geared towards the wrong goals in the military. Now, I'm not saying that that's true of the whole military. I want to definitely make that clear because I have nothing but respect for the military and for mm -hmm. people doing jobs that people normally don't want to do. We don't have a draft going because people are volunteering to go in so that way no one has to be forced to go in. Mm. It's not an easy job. These people have to do jobs that they don't want to because their bosses are telling them. And it's not like a regular job where you could say, I don't want to do that. I quit. You can't quit. And especially, what are you going to do? You're going to quit when you're in Iraq. You can't do that. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? So I just want to say, I have nothing but respect. Um, I am a disabled veteran. I, I, I'm happy to talk to other people about their experiences and nothing but respect for every branch. And I think what I, am ex what I experienced was more of central for my ship because my husband was in the military for many years and he goes, he was on the same ship as me. And he goes, that ship was just a piece of crap. He cannot stand the environment on that ship. Mm. He uh, definitely shares a lot of the feelings that I do. Um, it, so I, I, I think some of the best lessons from the military from that point of view was to how helpful it was to throw myself into something so awful to come out of it with a different appreciation of the good things in life. Um, you know, a lot of people say once you've been in prison, you really feel appreciative of everything else. And I feel so appreciative of everything else after the military. I really do. I remember when I finally left and I was driving across the country back here to Arizona 
it's one of the most blissful times in my life thinking I get to do this. I get to do this. I didn't choose to stay in. I get to do this. And I get to make these choices for myself. And that's a big thing too, actually, is that you get to make choices for yourself. And I think people take that for granted. You don't make the choices for yourself in the military. You do not choose when you get up. You do not choose what to wear. You do not choose what to eat. And you do not choose how to work. You don't. You're given a uniform. You're given breakfast. You're told what time to get up. You're told how to do your job. And the fact that we get choices on what to eat and what we want to do is something that so many people just, I I don't think, realize how awesome it is. Mm. And you know what? I'm going to say that that's actually the biggest thing that I've learned is how appreciative I am to make my own choices and not be told every little thing I have to do. Uh, That's excellent. Do you have any change in mindset while you're in the military? Or the, yeah. A huge shift, yeah. A lot of, lot of shifts. Um, I don't talk about politics, but I will say that my um, a lot of my political beliefs shifted greatly because when I wasn't in the military, I was on one side of the spectrum, um, fully on one side of the spectrum, political-wise. And then when I joined, I went, I, I was wrong. I was wrong in the sense of looking at things from one point of view and being so radical about it. And so that's that shifted completely for me and gave me different perspectives. And I don't like to label myself one political view or another. I I am very, very much, um, I'm very closely aligned with one viewpoint now, but I really take into account different political viewpoints from all parts of the spectrum, which is how it, you know, why it's difficult for me to say I'm this, I'm, I'm blue, I'm red, I'm this. no, I don't, I don't do that. Mm. Um, so that that certainly changed. Um, other viewpoints that have changed is how to look at how easy people take direction. <laughs> I know that sounds funny, but um, in the military, for instance, your chief or your your devo, your officer tells you you will do this, and you do it. Mm. And out in the civilian life, your boss tells you to go do something, and you can do it. You can be defiant. You can kind of half-ass it. And it's something that's really, really been fascinating to me because the military and a civilian job are the same in the sense of it's a job. You get paid and you have to do what you're told. But there is such a giant difference in how people react to what they have to do. And so a viewpoint for me has been looking at I'm going to look at the whole situation. Am I asked to being do? Am I asked? Am I being asked to do something unethical? In the military, you can't stand up for yourself, but now I can, and that's something that I remember. If I'm being asked to do something I do not align with, is unsafe, is unethical, whatever, I am extraordinarily vocal about it, and I will protect anyone else who will be involved in that situation. I've gotten flack for it, and I've gotten trouble for it, but I've never gotten fired for it. And so that's a perspective that has definitely been important to me because you you don't have that option in the military. What are your views on reincarnation? So I think I um I recently released an episode. Um I do remember my past life. So I I fully believe in reincarnation and I have um a really amazing uh friend who is a famous psychic i don't know if he wants me to say his name so i'll just kind of keep it <laughs> um and it wraps for now and he is connected with some of my loved ones who are, are on the other side and so i've gotten confirmation from reincarnation from that um but for me i, I believe in it i i remember the things in my past life i remember going through things in this life to help heal the karma in the last life i have a hard time believing that there's, oh, I don't like to put it this way, um, but for lack of any better visualization, I'm going to put it this way. I don't believe that there's necessarily a soul machine that's like pumping out one soul per body. You have this life and then you're done and you're determined to go to a set place forever, heaven or hell. I have a hard time believing that because to me, that's like a one and done opportunity. 
that's saying that while you're on earth, you do things to please the controlling deity. And if it's not done in a proper way, then you go to heaven or you go to hell. It's one and done. And I don't fully believe that that's the case because there's, well, first, there's so many opportunities on earth and so many different ways of believing in God that how can anything be a one and done? You know, I, we, we've all had so many second chances and with the different ways, uh, the different religions and the different documents on what pleases God, then it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Reincarnation makes sense to me in the sense of I'm here, I'm here for something or some things. I'm here to, you know, maybe do the best that I can to improve this soul. Maybe I'm here to correct things from the last life. Maybe I'm here you know, at some point to help other lives, I, I don't know. But at the end of it, I hope to go back and recycle that soul to get rid of the bad and to come into the next one with more good. And the fact that I was able to, and my remembering my past life came from when I was really young, um, which is one of the best times to remember your past life before all the adult earthly influences come into um, your conscious and really start to infiltrate you. But I told my parents, I said, I was a fisherman. I died at sea and it was absolutely real. It wasn't a dream. I, I, I knew this from the deepest sense of, of my being and I explained it all to them. And then when I was in the military, um, I had a chance to go to the West coast and I knew that entering into the Pacific Ocean is, you know, uh, something as simple as, as that is looked at by a lot of people. I knew how healing that was for me because that's where I died. And it was the most beautifully anticipated moment of me walking into the same place where I died last life. And I knew that if I walked into that water and came out alive, then I completely closed the door on something I couldn't do in the last life. And I did. It was simple. I walked in the water. I felt weight taken off of me as if I just dropped 30 pounds into the ocean. I walked out and I've, I haven't been the same since. That, that part of my spirit that was there to long to be healed is healed. And I've looked more and more into who I was in the last life. I have a lot of details, some I don't, um, and that's okay. And so I don't, for me, I don't see how it, how it, uh, can't be real. I, I think that we are here for certain things and then we choose to jump into other bodies to kind of fulfill other reasons. And maybe we jump into a different human body. Maybe we jump into a dog body. I, I don't have the answers for that. It, it's a, a really strange topic. And just like everything happens for a reason, I'm still swimming in that ocean, <laughs> trying to look for things that make sense. And I definitely don't have it all all i have is really my proof um and the proof of a few other minor things uh, have you at all tried to find like records of the person you believed yourself to be yes how, how did that go oh yeah yeah i've done i've done ancestry searches i've done record searches um the problem is is i don't have the proper spelling of the last name and so every time i look i know the first name but I don't have the proper spelling of the last name. And it, it's been difficult for me to try to come up with the right combination because it's a common first name. And so I still go on and look. I still try to find some records. Um, I know the time period of death, but I don't, I, I don't like searching ancestry. Um, I, they make you pay for some things and I, I get it, right? They're a service, they, and they provide you with things and you should pay for a service. I get that, I get that. But I was looking at something from my actual family tree years ago. And so I signed up for Ancestry and you have to put in your real information and that's fine. Hmm. So at the time I did, and next thing you know, I get contact from my mother and I went, huh? <laughs> And on Ancestor, we're like, oh, you're connected to this person, that person. I went, well, I didn't do that shit. And immediately closed Ancestry and had to change my phone number again. And I went, so I'm not going on Ancestry. So they basically so I'm trying to... connected you. It's like kind of like a Facebook. They connected you to your mom when you, you went uh, in the yeah. market to... 
be connected anymore. Exactly. I'm like, that's not what I wanted this for at all. And uh, so that was that experience. Uh, so I'm still interested. I'm still very interested. I'm trying to find other ways to see how can I get the right last name? Because if I can, if I can get that spelling, I'm pretty sure it's going to be really easy to narrow it down. Oh, well, definitely do a podcast about that. If you, if you manage to find it, I'll be super interested. Oh, I would love to. Yeah. Excellent. Um, uh, I have one more reincarnation question. Sure. In your memory, what is it like to die? Oh, God. What a fucking awesome question. It's scary when you when you don't know what's happening you don't, and you don't know why it's happening. Because when I died, it's like, when I died, I didn't quite understand how it was happening in that way. And why it was happening. So the act of my body being taken away from me when I had no control was terrifying, especially because I died alone. And I think what that's done is helped to bring a different awareness of death into this life. And just like how the Stoics practice how you should always be conscious of your death, it's something I'm very, very aware of now. And I have zero fear of death. I don't like the idea of suffering before death, but I don't fear death at all. I look at it as if if I got to go, I got to go. I mean, if someone was like, you're going to die tomorrow. Okay. Zero fear of it. I'm going to go tomorrow. I've been here and gone before. And all you're telling me is it's time for me to leave this body and to go do something different. Okay. Job reassignment. Got it. Um, But when you, when you don't exactly have in mind that you're dying Or when you do and you're like, oh my God, I'm dying. And it hits you in a fear sense and it hits you in a sense of uncontrollable because we have, we feel like we have so much control within this life. Then it's scary. It's very scary. So I understand why people are scared of death. But I think when death is looked at as a, as a job reassignment, (laughs) it's, it's not scary. You know, I'm, I'll go when it's, I'll go when I got to go. That's okay. Hey, thanks for listening and thank you to Wifey for joining me. Check out her show via her website, chickenmindnuggets.com and catch her on Twitter at MindChicken and on Instagram at ChickenMindNuggets. And that's all I have to say on the matter. Okay, nice one. Bye.